Chapter 15 Jonas entered the annex room and realized immediately that it was a day when he would be sent away. The giver was rigid in his chair, his face in his hands. I'll come back tomorrow, sir, he said quickly. Then he hesitated. Unless maybe there's something I could do to help. The giver looked up at him, his face contorted with suffering. Please, he gasped, take some of the pain. Jonas helped him in his chair at the side of the bed. Then he quickly removed his tunic and lay face down. Put your hands on me, he directed, aware that in such anguish the giver might need reminding. The hands came, and the pain came with them, and through them. Jonas braced himself and entered the memory, which was torturing the giver. He was in a confused, noisy, foul-smelling place. It was daylight, early morning, and the air was thick with smoke that hung, yellow and brown, above the ground. Around him, everywhere, far across the expanse of what seemed to be a field, lay groaning men. A wild-eyed horse, its bridle torn and dangling, trotted frantically through the mounds of men, tossing its head, whining in panic. It stumbled finally, then fell, and did not rise. Jonas heard a voice next to him. Water, the voice said in a parched, croaked whisper. He turned his head toward the voice and looked into the half-closed eyes of a boy who seemed not much older than himself. Dirt streaked the boy's face and his matted blonde hair. He lay sprawled, his gray uniform glistening with wet, fresh blood. The colors of the carnage was grotesquely bright. The crimson wetness of the rough and dusty fabric, the ripped shreds of grass, startling green, and the boy's yellow hair. The boy stared at him. Water, he begged again. When he spoke, a new spurt of blood drenched the coarse cloth across his chest and sleeve. One of Jonas's arms was immobilized with pain, and he could see that his own torn sleeve something that looked like ragged flesh and splintered bone. He tried his remaining arm and felt it move. Slowly he reached to, its, to his side, felt the metal container there, and removed its cap, stopping the small motion of his hand now and then to wait for the surging pain to ease. Finally, when the container was open, he extended his arm slowly across the blood-soaked earth, inch by inch, and held it to the lips of the boy. Water trickled into the imploring mouth and down the gri grimy chin. The boy sighed. His head fell back, his lower jaw dropping as if he had been surprised by something. A dull blankness slid across his eyes. He was silent, but the noise continued all around. The cries of the wounded men, the cries begging for water and for mother and for death. Horses lying on the ground shrieked, raising their heads and stabbed randomly toward the sky with their hooves. From the distance, Jonas could hear the thud of cannons. Overwhelmed by pain, he lay there in the fearsome stench for hours, listening to the men and animals die, and learned what warfare meant. Finally, when he knew that he could bear it no longer and would become death himself, he opened his eyes and, would, and was once again on the bed. The giver looked away as if he could not bear to see what he had done to Jonas. Forgive me, he said. Mm -hmm.